consumer hardware, which is basically a primer on manufacturing and ethnography of use. So for fair warning, this is really a 20 or 30 minute talk. I've got a lot of information on the slides. You will want to go through and read them later. Uh, let me start my slide timer. Excellent. So uh, what this talk will cover is um, basically another representation of the design process you saw in the previous presentation. You've got ethnography of use, which is working with your users, functional design, um, which includes both ergonomics of use, technical engineering design, and design for manufacturability, and then ideally you get to a shipping product. There's actually a lot more around this. The lesson here is that ergonomics of use, making things easy for your users, generally tends to fight with design for manufacturability or making something incredibly cheap. Um, ethnography of use, just to go through in words, is choosing your user and learning their background and needs to inform what your product design needs to look like. Functional design is your engineering proof of concept, proving out that your you know, electronics, your engineering, the concept works. Ergonomics of use is going back to your users and looking at how they interact with your technology. And your goal is to push use error down to 20 to 0%. Like you want your thing to be usable for the ethno ethnographic group you chose. Design for manufacturability is then taking all of that input and trying to make it super simple and reliable to manufacture, where your goal is to get manufacturing yields up to 100% and failures down to nothing. And then you want to ship product, but you want to repeat this cycle over the lifetime of the product as you get user feedback. So starting with ethnography of use, um, first you want to identify your possible users because that helps you identify your market need and also what you need to do to design to suit those users. It doesn't matter if they're hobbyists, ninjas, robots, or freegans. Then you need to pick one group to focus on first. You can target other groups later. Um, then you do your ethnographic research, which is interacting with people, getting to know them. You design your prototype and then you run repeat beta tests and you see how people interact with things without extra help because that helps you prove out whether or not your product is foolproof, your documentation is foolproof, or if it's actually easy to use. So, moving on to ergonomics of use, which is interacting with your users. Um, this is pretty counter to what a lot of people think, but the user is always right. And according to the FDA, and for good industrial design, there's no such thing as user error, only bad design. So, read the manual is not the right answer if you're trying to make something that people want to use. Um, basically, if your goal is to have your product go out, have people use it, have them build on it, have them extend on it, it's often more successful if your product is effective than if your engineering idea is the right one. So, um, ergonomics of use, basic things that I see all the time working in the lab with students who are using open source hardware is floor plan and ergonomics. If you design a widget and it's very complicated to wire up to get from point A to point B, that's hard. You can actually do floor planning design to make connections straightforward. You can also use standard pinouts and key to unidirectional connectors to make sure that people can't plug things in backwards because then it's more robust for them to use, it's easier for them to assemble. Another tip is avoid putting power and ground on symmetric pins so that you don't have them blow up their chip if they do happen to plug something in backwards. Um, another thing on ergonomics of use is that um, always use protection. So people tend to take what they have and sort of plug it in and hope it works well enough. Um, a common problem I see in the lab is that we can't tell the five volt wall boards from the nine volt wall boards. So someone takes a five volt only board that has no over voltage input protection and it's a 50-50 chance of whether or not they blow it up. Similarly, when possible, it's easy for the users if you always use function specific connectors so that they don't get confused. Um, and pretty much every open source battery charger has a USB connector two JST connectors and people are like, which one's the battery, which one's the load, and can it connect two batteries? Um, but you can't engineer around everything. I and mean, your goal is to make it easy for people to use, but you can't design around gross misuse or someone being very incompetent. You just have to suck that one up. So the whole point of making a usable, extensible product is that it goes places where you don't predict it would go. So these are two devices at the Vs Institute, um, the Evolvulator and uh, device prototype I'm working on, and there's Arduino inside because Arduino is very, very handy for intermediate device prototyping. And the usability goes just beyond the hardware design to include everything from support software, seamless IDEs, portability across platforms. Having a typical library of circuit applications is key, particularly for your new users. And you know, good customer support and all of those things help people take your things farther in the market and it gives you market loyalty. So next up with design for manufacturability, since ergonomics of use, you can add a lot in. Um, is basically, in philosophy, it's trying to make something fast, cheap, and easy to manufacture reliably. 
if you understand what the manufacturing process is, all of the de design for manufacturability will start to become common sense. So your goal is to, to learn DFM. I learned from talking to CAD engineers. You can learn from talking to vendors. They really love nerding out about what they do. They're experts at it. They like to talk about it, and they'll tell you all about their rules. So for electronics DFM, um, there's a whole lot that goes into making a product. You have your printed circuit board rules, your assembly rules, your product assembly rules, like the Apple look and feel. We can only cover two of these. There's a lot of information here. So I'm going to go quickly. There are going to be checklists. How most PCBs are made is with a lamination process or you can do direct milling. So the best way to start with how do I make my PCB manufacturable is to go to the vendor capability website and read up. Um, as a general rule, increasing cost in manufacturing if you get something quoted by a vendor doesn't mean that it's not manufacturable. It just means that it requires more preci machi mis uh, precision machining. But if your goal is a low price target, you want to sort of try to work towards their cheapest capabilities. Also, all of them offer DFM design rule checkers because it makes their lives easier and it's a good tool for you to use. So, DFM checklist for PCB routing. When possible, use a lot of copper, but not too much. Um, otherwise, it creates you know, assembly issues. You use 45 degree routing at about acute um, interior angles, not because of like electrons bouncing off the walls, but because it forms an acid trap or a risk that the trace will delaminate. The reason why you use more copper is because it makes it easier to rework boards. Um, don't put vias in pads or direct connect part pads to copper because then that makes it very, very hard to reflow solder. And when you're trying to fit a part footprint on a board, don't forget slop. All of these things are made by round drills routing things out, and you have to actually include those tolerances. So now for the assembly part, it's all in the footprints. Um, footprints are assembly method dependent. Um, so you have three basic assembly methods, human hand assembly. It's when your product is a kit and someone's building it at a number of uh, experience levels. Then you have mid to low volume manufacturing, which is often involving a pick and place um, for surface mount components, reflow ovens, but then human hand assembly. And in fact, a surprising number of Apple products are entirely you know, um, hybrid uh, manufactured. Then you have fully automated machine assembly, which is massively high throughput, where everything is automated from component placement, reflow, and optical inspection. So for assembly design rules, um, you need to get to know what your part libraries are. Since it's all the footprints, these footprints are stored in your part library. A lot of people have library parts out there. These are the basic components. Um, there are the same things for both through hole and surface mount pads, keep outs, and assembly courtyards. Um, in terms of component footprints, if you want to know where to get the information for making a footprint to put your part on a board, you can start with um, data sheets from the manufacturers, or you can actually go to um, the Institute for Interconnecting and Packaging Electronic Circuits, or the IPC standard. Uh, they've done a lot of process manufacturing for mass manufacturing methods to find footprints that are just right. Um, and it's a, it's a whole lot of information from a huge number of companies and manufacturers. Again, they've done this, made this standard to make their lives easier, and there are a lot of free tools that you can use to view IPC standard footprints, but I do encourage you that if you're designing for kits or lower volume or hybrid assembly, experiment with your footprints and learn what works for you. So, stepping back, if you're expecting someone, especially a novice, to be able to hand build your board, then in general, with all of these part footprints, you want to make the copper access pads and courtyards, which is the room around the component, larger, so it's easier for them to get in tools, particularly if they have cheaper soldering irons if they're less experienced. But if you're going towards high density, that's when you start shifting towards mass manufacturing. Pro tip, check out existing CAD libraries. There are a bunch available, links are on the bottom. And another pro tip is always trust but verify. Uh, even manufacturers have incorrect information on their data sheets. So here are DFM tips for human assemblies. You want to minimize the number of different parts values because if you give one, uh, a kit builder 10 100 ohm resistors, that's great, but if you give them like 10 slightly different resistors, that's hard for them. You want to match the component type and overall size to their skill level. So if you're targeting soldering for kids versus soldering for adults, that's where you go. Um, here's a little sketch actually showing growing the pads and showing component density uh, to make lives easier. Then it's the same thing for machine assembly. You want to select the components to be compatible with your vendor's rules. You want to keep everything on the same side to keep it cheap. You want to accommodate wave or reflow soldering, have clear um, fiducial markers for all of their automated visual inspection, and also um, always give your assembly house a really detailed build of materials. It makes their life easier. 
So this is the completed view. Um, if you go through and make shipping product, you always want to get user feedback and incorporate that back in and iterate. That's how you actually get community loyalty to build things up together. So for acknowledgments, thanks to the colleagues who have given me opportunities to learn from my mistakes, because I've learned everything I know about DFM from talking to vendors and crusty CAD engineers and machinists. And uh, if you have any questions, please go ahead and give me an email. Thank you.